So we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, it's a little bit after eight uh, on East Coast time. So we have Journal Club uh, from AO North America on Talos Fractures uh, that's hosted as moderators by myself and Dr. Nick Romeo in Cleveland. Uh, and we're very appreciative of all of our guest faculty tonight. This is a list of our guest faculty. Uh, we'll be joined by Dr. Anna Miller and Dr. Heather Vallier, as well as potentially Dr. Linval later uh, this evening. These are, these are disclosures relevant to the uh, moderators and guest faculty. Please, as a reminder here, you know, you know, a little over a year and a half into COVID uh, pandemic on Zoom etiquette, please have your microphones muted and videos turned off. We're gonna use the electronic Q&A for questions. Please direct them this way. And Nick and myself is potentially, as well as others, will try and moderate these and either answer them live or electronically back in the Q&A box. This is our agenda in brief. Uh, we'll be reviewing the three interviews that are pre-recorded, uh, followed by a question and answer session with the faculty panel, and then a wrap up. The learning objectives are listed below. To learn how to understand, uh, to understand, review, and review these journal articles, identify best clinical practices for these injuries, and specifically for this TALUS edition, to review the vascular supply, to focus on key injury characteristics, that may alter sequelae of these injuries and understand common long-term um, outcomes and sequelae of these injuries. Without further ado, we'll go to the interview with Dr. Miller. We are not hearing the sound. Um, Surgery but... discussed the mass care of the tail. Thank, Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Um, I just wanted to start out by asking, what was the prompting for you and your colleagues to perform this study and what were you expecting to, what was your working hypothesis with this? So um, this was a study I worked on when I was a resident and this was led by one of my mentors in residency, probably my main mentor, Dean Lorich, who many of you know and um, have been influenced by. Um, so basically Dr. Lorich had started doing some vascularity studies with the femoral head a couple of years before this, and I was involved in that also. Um, and what he found was the MRI techniques they were using at the time at Hospital for Special Surgery were really advanced and, um, you know, kind of on the cutting edge of MRI use in the country. So we thought maybe if we look at these, um, injuries that have a really high rate of avascular necrosis, like femoral neck fractures, talus fractures, we may find other um, vascularity, maybe to help us learn what we need to protect more. But also, our hypothesis was actually that we would see more than what we've traditionally learned from the textbooks. And the reason for that is um, most of the older studies are like the latex injections where you can kind of see the um, arterial supply to the bone and dissect it out, but it's not very, very high resolution because you have to get the latex into those vessels. So what we learned on the femoral neck study or the femoral head study is that um, we were seeing a lot more kind of unnamed vessels, really tiny vessels that probably give a lot more vascular supply than we originally gave credit in that area. So our hypothesis really was that we would probably find more than what's traditionally been described and then maybe give us some answers on why not every talus that gets a neck fracture goes on to avascular necrosis. Awesome. Um, and in with the results of what you found, how has that changed what your mentors did and what you've done in your practice with respect to talus fracture care? I don't think it has made a huge difference um, in you know everyday practice. I think the biggest thing is to help us just understand that there is more than just the traditional kind of two areas of blood supply and that a lot of the blood supply comes from the posterior. So one thing that I definitely try not to do is really dissect all the way around the talus. And we rarely have to do that sometimes when you're doing the medial and lateral approach, you may see that it goes across because of the trauma. But um, the only time I've really had that concern is when we've had some irreducible talus. And then you're really trying to get around and figure out what is keeping it from being reduced. And I try to be very 
wary of, you know, completely cutting off all these um, great collaterals that you can see in the figure from the paper. The other thing that I learned um, just doing this actual study, we did the, you know, injections, we did the MRIs, and then afterwards we dissected out every single talus and actually pulled them out of the cadavers. And um, I found it very interesting that you could ever, ever have an extruded talus because it is impossible to get those things out. It would take forever to cut every little you know, connection that's holding the talus in place. And it was shockingly hard to get them out. So whenever I see a dislocated talus or an extruded one, I'm always, I always think back about how hard that was to get out. So it is interesting. So I would just say back to your question, not a significant change, but just to be continuously very careful with the dissection, but also to know if you get in there and it has already been completely destroyed, you know, underneath the talus, like where we normally think of the blood supply or in the sinus tarsi, we're not, you know, giving up on that patient. They can still have a significant blood supply from the posterior in particular. Um, I guess the scenario that comes to mind is if you have a patient with a tailor neck and or body that you would fix from an anterior dorsal dual approach as a medial and lateral, but someone who also had a significant posterior medial or posterior fracture, would that give you pause on doing a third approach, a, a posterior medial approach, and saying whether you would try and perform reduction of fixation through some anterior base means or percutaneously only? Like how does how do those injuries, I know they're more rare than not, but how would you approach those in the setting of this? Yeah, I definitely think that's a great question. Again, rare injuries, but um, for me, I definitely think if you can, at least try to preserve one area of the blood supply. So, which probably in that case, it would be whichever one is more displaced, you would have, you know, some idea that that's probably the more disrupted blood supply. So maybe if you can, if the next more displaced, you're doing your regular two standard approaches, and then you maybe try to do percutaneous clamps or something else for a posterior part. Um, but yeah, I would definitely try not to dissect all the way around if possible. Okay. Is there anything with having been part, having done this study, is there anything that you in retrospect or your colleagues would have done differently or that you've seen done in subsequent cadaveric studies looking at vascularity? I, yeah, I think the, the one thing I would really like to do, not that we would do it differently, but kind of part two or maybe even the more interesting part of the study would be to do it in patients who actually have a fracture. Um, you know, either an actual patient with a fracture would be pretty challenging to get that, you know, protocol done before you're trying to get them fixed. But even, um, you know, doing a cadaver study, but where you do an osteotomy of the talus and then inject it and see where the contrast or fluid goes and see you know, how that disrupts, like doing a pre and post osteotomy kind of study, I think would be really interesting to kind of prove that that blood supply and maybe even see how the circulation or the collaterals change that blood supply after the osteotomy occurs. I also think it could be interesting to do a similar study after you fix the fracture. So in a live patient, you know, if you did a study where you did these MRIs after the fracture was fixed to see what the circulation is, you know, does that predict whether it's going to get AVN or not? You know, studies like that, I think, would be interesting. I think there are a lot more future studies that can be done, but I don't think there's a lot more to this. Um, there is a paper that we published. There's one of the figures is the same from Foot and Ankle International in 2010. And we actually wanted to publish this paper first, but it just, with the editorial manager and everything, the other one just happened to get published first. So the figures got a little confusing during that time, but the other one is really looking more at the art arterial anatomy itself. Um, and I think the combination of those really kind of covered everything we wanted to with these studies. For you, when you have these um, come in tailor neck displaced fractures with associated dislocations or other extensions, what are your like first things that come to your mind when you're teaching the residents and fellows in your in your institution? Well, I think the first thing 
is obviously to get the patient reduced. Um, for us, you know, it's always kind of controversial about do they need an X fix or is how urgently do you need to get the fracture fixed? Um, I think in general these days, we all agree that the best fracture fixation is probably going to give you the best outcomes as opposed to the fastest fracture fixation. So we're not generally doing these, you know, in the middle of the night, unless it's an open something or something that's irreducible. Um, but that's kind of the thing we really try to teach the residents is that we're trying to get the best fixation. And we definitely hearken back to Dr. Vollier's landmark papers. Uh, often to talk about, you know, the AVN rates after these kinds of injuries and just letting the patient know how severe the injury is and that really the original displacement is probably the biggest predictor. Well, I sincerely thank you for your time. And All right, we're going to move on to the next interview. which is from Dr. Lindvall, concerning the open reduction and stable fixation of isolated displaced tailored neck and body fractures that was published in JBJS. So I'm here for AO North America Journal Club discussing tailless fractures with Dr. Eric Lindvall uh, in his JBJS 2003 paper regarding the open reduction fixation of tailored body and neck fractures. Thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. Um, I'd like to start out by asking, what was the prompt for you and your colleagues in Tampa for performing this study? So really, I think it really had to do with, uh, in the treatment of these fractures, it was kind of unclear in the literature as to what the true incidence of osteonecrosis versus post-traumatic osteoarthritis were because so many of the studies had limited follow-up or they had non-displaced fractures or they had associated particular fractures. So our goal was to try to clean that up and kind of look at the isolated displaced fractures of the neck and body and then kind of report on the results of that. And in, 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 in your findings in the paper, what are the major takeaways that you to this day, almost, uh, you know, almost 20 years later, find to be the key or most important takeaways from your manuscript? So I, I think it has to do with probably the, the long-term outcomes that we were able to find because the study had a minimum of four-year follow-up. So, so it gave us come, come kind of a benchmark as to what's expected long-term. And we found that in the displaced fractures, at least, they really end up with all, 100% end up with osteoarthritis, some form of it, and then also with some form of discomfort in that ankle. So, so knowing those two things that helped with our future counseling and such like that, the treatment piece, I think a uh, piece we did find, um, we were able to came, maybe not have to rush out of bed in the middle of the night to fix these with the tent that it went up with ADN in the future. Although in this time frame, we were trying to do that because that was kind of the reported um, procedure or technique to avoid the ADN. So after the results of this, we kind of were able to look at it and maybe say, hey, you know what? Some of these maybe can get reduced and spit in the splint overnight and get done next day. So that's something that for you from the development of this to how you practice today has changed in terms Correct. of power. Yes. Um, is, there, is there certain key phrases or things you try very hard to convey to your patients at the time of injury and as well in follow-up? But what type of things do you say to them with respect to outcomes? Yeah, I think, I think that's important because their expectations, once known at the beginning, help the treatment course and, and their outcome just because of the way they frame it and look at it. So part of that discussion, it really is about the AVN, about the osteonecrosis possibilities. And then uh, the fact that the arthritis, arthritis does form long-term in some form, we try to explain to them that that will occur, whether it's symptomatic or a real problem for you, we don't know. But if you were a runner, uh, maybe you want to rethink that and start taking up cycling or those kind of things, but not with the intent to decrease their activity level, but maybe modify it so they're not hampered uh, more by the injury. Within, within the body of the manuscript describing the uh, methods, it's discussed that uh, there was CT scans obtained in addition and possibly MRI. Can you talk about the use of advanced imaging postoperatively that you used in the manuscript and if you use it now? 
So uh, personally, I, I don't do a lot of post-operative CAT scanning. I think the radiographs are kind of indicative of their symptoms, meaning if we see some arthritic change or if we see some type of AVN collapse. But I think the MRI initially in our study, we were using them because we were trying to make sure there wasn't a form of AVN and trying to use titanium screws and those things to avoid more artifact. But I think over time, I'm not sure that's as relevant because the x-rays can truly find the arthritic changes. We can see the collapse of the talus. So routinely, I don't personally get post-op CAT scans. I think the pre-op setting, it's uh, really important to do that just because you can assess and plan the, the surgery. But I, I, don't, I don't find a need personally to get them often post-operatively only because we can see those changes on x-ray. Okay. Um, you mentioned the use of titanium screws. Could you touch on the fixation used in this manuscript and how yours has either stayed the same or evolved in the last several years? Yeah, so so back in this day, obviously, kind of screws were the technique and the plates were kind of a thing of the future still. And now I know a lot of, a lot, a lot of people that have published on this have gone to plate fixation in certain instances. I think, I think it's very valuable in certain, certain situations where there's a lot of common use and you're afraid of over compressing and ending with a varus angulation or a deformity. But I personally haven't used a lot of plates because I think they are a little bulkier and they have some other symptoms from those. So I personally have been able to stick with the screws. Um, we'll put in the, the side that's maybe not as common at first to avoid the over compression and then a position screw on the opposite side um, where the, the collapse may occur. So I haven't personally used much in the plating realm, but I know others haven't had success with it. So okay. I guess to answer your question, I, I still stuck with the sim similar fixation type, but I know others have been successful with the plating. Gotcha. Um, we, we, talked, we just talked, touched upon fixation. Is there anything with this manuscript that after you and your colleagues, after it was accepted and published, is there anything you would look back and do differently to help add to the strength of the paper or to do differently? Um, yeah, I, I think in hindsight, we would have liked to add more patients, right? I mean, I think most studies would say that, but in this instance, you know, others have published with greater numbers. And I think we, we, we ended up with such a small number because we tried to turn into just the isolated displaced fractures. So we end up knocking out a lot of cases because they had associated neo mouse, calc, some other thing that may cloud that true incidence of oste or, uh, I mean, um, osteoarthritis. Yeah. So we tried to limit it. So. So in hindsight, we could have lengthened it a little bit, wait a little longer and pulled in more cases, which would have been nice. Um, another, another thing would have been possibly to uh, use a different outcomes measure. We use that, you know, the uh, ankle scoring system. Yep, the AOFAS. And we probably could have gone to the SF36. I think in hindsight, we commented on that in the paper. Yes, but that may have been a little more relevant outcome measure in, 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 according to our current standards. So. Gotcha. Um, is there, in, in terms of future research, do you think that there's a specific area that you would like to see answered in the literature regarding these injuries? Or specific question, excuse me? Um, yeah, so, so I think, I guess to that question, um, in, in, a, in a bigger sense, I think gross anatomy is one of those things where once you kind of discover that, I don't think there's a lot of change that occurs with that, hopefully not. I know we're still evolving in some fashion, but I don't know how much of our anatomy is. But, but with that being said, I, I think the rest of the literature body, just because technology changes, techniques change, I think that's always relevant to continue publishing on items like this that may, in the end, do better with plates or some other thing that comes about at a later date. So to answer your question, I think there's always relevance to new studies, either to confirm what we thought before or to show different changes in the future. Okay. I think gross anatomy studies are one of those that may may not be as relevant to that, but yeah. Gotcha. And then when you when you have these injuries come in, what are things that you you know what are the top three things you tell you ask or make sure that your residents or trainees know in California regarding these injuries? So the displaced you know the displaced fractures you know the Hawkins two and threes we we go after those reductions in a closed fashion if they come in in the evening time or nighttime because or access gets tricky and things. So we'll try to do those in the morning, but I think a reduction is important. Although we say in here that maybe timing is not as critical. I think we could have added the fact that a reduction of that fracture would be beneficial. I, I can't believe leaving it unreduced would be of any benefit. So, and most of them will reduce reasonably, you know, sometimes the body will stay spun in the, in the joint, but I think a lot of times the neck will come in reasonable alignment, subtail joint can reduce. So I think that's a beneficial move that we try to get done early 
and avoid just leaving it displaced overnight. Great. Um, well, I really appreciate your time and for joining us for discussion of your article. And um, thank you so much for joining Okay, that concludes that interview and we will move on uh, to Dr. Valier's article concerning a new look at the Hawkins classification for Taylor neck fractures. <clears throat> Hello everyone, I'm Nick Romeo. Tonight we are discussing uh, Dr. Heather Valier's 2014 paper on reevaluating the Hawkins classification for Taylor neck fractures, specifically looking at what factors are predicting the lost necrosis. Dr. Valier, thank you for joining me tonight and for participating in our journal club. Thank you so much for this invitation. I look forward to it. Great. So let's go ahead and get started. So what, what inspired or prompted you to, to take a look back at this classification? Is there anything you saw in, in your treatment of these patients that you, you, know, you saw something different going on with the classification system? Well, for, for many years, I felt that the Hawkins classification didn't accurately um, portray the real risk for osteonecrosis. I mean, it's a classification system that's based on the initial fracture displacement and the implications of that on damage to the blood supply and thus the resultant osteonecrosis that can happen. And so it seemed to me that particularly the group two injuries that Hawkins described, that is those with a subtalar dislocation or subluxation is really a very um, disparate group. People who have subtle subluxation at the subtalar joint, maybe a few millimeters of displacement, yet never had a dislocation event, inherently would have less soft tissue damage and thus less potential for damage to the blood supply than those that sustain a complete dislocation at the subtalar joint. And so for the first several years I was in practice, I was really interested in looking at this in a little more detail with the idea being that maybe we could uh, drill down to what the osteoporosis rates were when comparing those two groups. And so that was really the, the impetus for doing this project. That would make sense. So in, in your paper, you'd hypothesized, as anyone would, the delay in reduction would affect the rates of lost to necrosis. And as you mentioned in your results, it was not the case, but that it was somewhat underpowered to detect that difference. Do you believe that this would have held true had you had a larger sample size? Yes, I do. I. I think it's interesting that most of the literature, in fact, all of it that I could find at the time, really reported the timing of fixation from the time that they presented to the hospital. They didn't report on the time to the reduction, and they don't report on the time after the reduction to fixation. And so really missing those details leaves us kind of wondering as to what's going on. And it, it seems to me that the initial injury event is going to cause some damage to the blood supply if it's going to and to the surrounding soft tissues. Now, if it's not tearing the arteries, it's just stretching them and pressing on them because of the dislocation. By reducing it, you're gonna re relieve the tension on those structures and thus improve the blood supply. So it seems that if there are patients that have stretched but not torn vessels, an expeditious reduction would reduce the chance of them developing osteonecrosis. And so unfortunately, because these are rare injuries, our sample was underpowered to show that or not. Um, I believe that it is still a, a factor. It's just that in our study, if you look at um, table two, the time into reduction is actually pretty fast. It's within several hours in the patients that developed osteonecrosis and those that didn't. So I think we need a much, much larger sample, probably a few yeah. hundred cases. Yeah, it's hard to get that many patients with these injuries for sure. Uh, were there any holdups to the study, either institutionally or just in you know, a method or anything like that? Did you have to make any changes at all? We didn't really need to make any changes. It was more just, um, you know, if I had to do it again, I would have been paying more attention and really uh, been aggressive about trying to follow my own injuries, my partner's injuries, who, as they would come in prospectively, because, you know, at a busy uh, urban level one trauma center, many of our patients aren't very good about following up if they're doing okay. So we tend to see those that are having trouble, uh, whether it's a problem or some sort of social problem. But those patients that following up. But the idea about um, getting further detail in the classification, specifically the Hawkins group two, 
I think we wouldn't have changed that. It would have just had better follow-up and perhaps more patients. So did, did after, you, after you completed this study, did anything change in your practice as far as management of these injuries? Was there anything in the, after doing the study that really made a difference for you? And then even since then, has there been anything else that has changed your practice and management of these injuries? So let's say a couple of things on that. One is that, uh, you know, when I, I trained um, at Harborview and, you know, we were um, instructed on two incision technique using dual lateral, medial lateral, lateral exposures to enhance visualization, accuracy reduction, and strategically place the implants. That whole piece hasn't changed, but I think that on the one hand, when I came into to practice about 20 years ago, um, most of my, my partners were pretty much fixing these all in the middle of the night still. And I didn't believe that it mattered. And so I just decided that I was gonna not do that. I was gonna reduce the dislocations and then try to come back when the soft tissue permits. Now, unfortunately, as you would recognize with many uh, Hawkins group three or type four injuries, of course, a closed reduction may not be possible. And so you're going to do an open reduction or at least a percutaneous assist reduction. And so um, the bulk of my patients, if I could achieve an adequate closed reduction, I just would split them and then come back, um, you know, 10, 14, 20 days later when the soft tissue were amenable. And I, I felt like that allowed us to build up a pretty large case series of patients that were treated deliberately on a delayed basis as long as they were reduced. However, because my partners were doing these still in the middle of the night, it gave us a little bit of a sample of similar injuries to, to compare. And um, over time, I think that they began to change their practice as well, which is good. You know, we talk and we kind of learn things from each other. I'd say the other thing that I started doing more of is we have um, better implants now in terms of more versatility with mini fragment implants, there wasn't as much available at the time that I started in the way of particularly um, 2.4 millimeter uh, screws fixation. And so just having uh, uh, better implants with more uh, screw options and things. And so I, I think I've scaled down and, and used um, smaller plates, smaller screws and really achieved the, the same outcome. But particularly for those that have uh, associated lateral process or body fractures, I think I can stabilize them more effectively with modern implants. Great, thanks. Uh, one other thing about the paper, what are your thoughts on those fractures that are associated with metamalleolar fractures compared to those who do not have metamalleolar fractures? Can you discuss how your paper may have affected your thoughts on that? I think that's a really fascinating question because as you realize, a large portion of the blood supply comes through that deltoid branch. Um, if the deltoid remains intact, because there's a medial malleolar fracture, it has always seemed to me that if the Taylor body dislocates, fractures through the medial, medial malleolus as it displaces, because that artery is still intact, you'd expect them to have a lower rate of osteonecrosis. And so one of the things that, that uh, Dr. Moore and I talked about a little bit is it would be really fun to be able to see that. Now, we didn't write that out as a formal hypothesis of this study, or it's certainly not in the paper, but I don't believe we're powered to do that. Not enough of the patients had a metamalleolar fracture. We'd have to have a much larger series. But I think it's interesting, and I would speculate that it's probably a good prognostic feature if you have that metamalleolar fracture. Furthermore, it gives you a really nice view of that whole corridor, the posterior aspect of the tailor neck into the tailor body in terms of more accurately assessing the reduction and your fixation. Um, and if you do have a tailor body element, many times you might do a Medial osteotomy even to address that, so it saves that um, work for you. So I, I think it is a favorable thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely can help out when you really got to get back there, especially in the more body fractures. Is there any part of the, the message of the paper that you feel that sometimes kind of gets lost in translation? Yeah, it's it, that's interesting too because I think for quite a while now, most people have recognized that the time of fixation itself probably does not impact the rate of osteonecrosis. And we've looked at this, Tampa's looked at that, Harborview. Um, a lot of places have looked at it. Many quite a long time that the timing of the fixation, they don't mention the fact that hey, you don't ever have to take care of these in the middle of the night. And I want to clarify, we need to ex viciously reduce dislocations. 
any time of the day, those should be reduced, but the timing of the definitive fixation um, seems to not impact the rate of osteonecrosis. And so it's important to alleviate the tension on the soft tissues, which may include part of the blood supply, but if for nothing else, you don't want to leave something dislocated because you're going to be tenting the skin and predisposing yourself to having a lot more soft tissue damage uh, and risk for infection. And so that piece, I think, is still getting lost a little bit, unfortunately. And so as a public service announcement, this is a good time to mention, we, we really should be expeditiously reducing those dislocations. But the definitive fixation, delay it as needed for soft tissue or for patient systemic illness. Totally agree with all that, thanks. Uh, is there anything that you would have done differently looking back now, as far as the, the study goes? Yeah, I think that um, you know would have been more aggressive about trying to keep these people uh, tucked in so that we had better follow-up and longer radiographic follow-up on, on some of them. I think I also would have called out to some of my friends at other large centers to see if they wanted to pull the data because you know, this is a large series of TLS fractures, but if we would have had maybe a half a dozen other hospitals, I think we could have done a lot more with it, maybe looking at that neonatal question and really ironing some things out that could be more definitive because it's a very difficult fracture to study, but there are a lot of centers that have approached them technically with a rather like-minded um, concept, and that, that could have been helpful. So looking back, that would have been something that I would have made an effort to do. And just finally, what are the, the take home points the paper wrote to you? Like, what do you want everyone to really, really know about it? So I would say the, the take homes are, you know, these are injuries that you want to uh, very uh, quickly identify and expeditiously reduce the dislocations. After that, the time of the definitive fixation is not so important other than waiting for the soft tissues and the patient to be ready to do that and doing it during the day when you're fresh, these are difficult injuries and you wanna be extremely accurate with your reduction, your fixation and, and generally I would advocate a two incision technique in order to do that accurately. Um, but I, say, I think the risk for osteonecrosis is really related to initial injury features, the presence of open fracture wounds and the initial fracture displacement in particular. The presence of a medial malula fracture may be um, protective. We don't have data that support that, but that's my speculation. And there's other patient factors, diabetes, tobacco use, things that inherently would affect microcirculation and thus predispose to more complications. Again, that really hasn't been shown, but it, it makes sense that it would because it's, it's relevant in other literature. Um, the other thing I would say is that if you're just a casual uh, operator in this area, you may want to transfer these patients and send them to someone who does a few more because they're not, they're not easy. Um, they're very challenging. And it's, it's difficult to get a series of them. So it's nice if you have uh, colleagues that you train with, or, um, you know, when you're, if you're doing a trauma fellowship, try to do a lot of these, do as many of them as you can get access to in your practice, because they are difficult and the soft tissues don't take a joke. And I think if you're not as experienced, you're more apt to damage the blood supply that remains. You really don't want to be dissecting dorsally over the tumor neck and plantarly and disrupting anything that might still be there in the way of blood supply. And that further, of course, undermines your soft tissues in general and predisposes you to higher rates of wound resistance and soft tissue complications. Great. Well, thank you for taking, taking the time out of your busy schedule to, to meet with me and us and talk about this uh, very interesting paper. And uh, have a good night. You too. Thank you so much for this opportunity. <clears throat>
to avoid disrupting any blood supply back there whatsoever, even if it's for, you know, it's somewhat percutaneous screw fixation. Thanks for the question. Um, good to be here. I, I don't, I don't think there's ever, you know, a absolute answer to that question. Um, I think if you can have a good fixation and stay out of that area, like do the screws A to P instead, maybe that's a good idea. But, you know, the posterior supply is really another supply. It's not dominant necessarily. If you have a Hawkins 4, you know, maybe it's disrupted too. It's a little hard to say, but I would say, you know, really the best fixation is important and I wouldn't avoid it just because of that. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Blair, do you have any comments on that or any thoughts? No, I agree with what Dr. Miller uh, just said. Um, and then a lot of times too, it's, it, it really just depends obviously on the fracture pattern, the orientation of the major fracture lines, the associated tissues. Um, the posi patient positioning and imaging can be kind of tricky. You know, it's really important to kind of plan that out. And, and along those lines, the body habit is, if you have a patient that's really obese um, in the proximal thighs and the midsection, sometimes it's just kind of tricky maneuvering the leg around and getting them all set up. So make sure that you, you look at that carefully when you're planning your tactic. Great, thanks. Uh, Dr. Valir, kind of tying your paper in with and even your paper previously from Harvard View 2004 uh, with Dr. Lindvall's paper. And Dr. Lindvall's paper, they almost all their patients developed post-traumatic arthritis, whereas in, in both your, your papers in, in, at Harvard View and uh, the study we talked about today, the, the rates were around 50 to 60 percent. What do you think accounts for the differences there between the two groups? You know, maybe is it the injury, the time of follow-up? It's probably hard to speculate. I think it's really tough to speculate, and there's probably a, a little bit of variability in, in, in surgical technique, and that's you're not going to be able to get your, your handle on that because we don't have, um, you know, full-on um, CT scans to assess uh, axial alignment, any residual malalignment that was, you know, post-operatively um, accepted, and, and then what happened over time. So I think duration of follow-up Factors of the initial injury are really hard to, to quantitate in any type of, of series like this, you know, chondral impactions, chondral destructions, um, malreductions, minor or major in the articular uh, uh, portions that can be associated with these, these neck fractures, even though, you know, by strict definition, the fracture is more of a body fracture once you um, progress into the anterior edge of the body and, and also uh, with the lateral process, but a lot of these are co combo injuries. So I think that's part of it. Um, and there's just issues around patient age, uh, tissue integrity, so many things that are gonna play in. And so those would all be um, problematic. And then as, as things go, you know, I know one of the weaknesses of the Harborview series was the lack of radiographical follow-up after a longer period of time. And it was frustrating, but it's not surprising when you think about the practice, particularly when you're checking on these patients um, retrospectively. And that was prior to the age of any digital imaging. And so, yeah. you know, things have changed uh, quite a lot. And I feel like this is an injury, um, as I feel like a lot about our articular injury, I hope that over time, registry information so that we can catalog our own, so that we can share information and do studies together longer term to follow these and to follow them more consistently with radiographs at specific time points and have a definitive way of, of um, measuring uh, initial final alignment and subtle changes that would qualify as, as post-traumatic arthrosis uh, or osteonecrosis for that matter to kind of really learn more about it as we go. And I think um, over that time period too, you know, surgical technique has been refined. We talked a little bit about implants, you know, on the call, on the, on the journal club so far, everybody's been mentioning that. I think we're just gonna continue to get a little better and better at, at what we do. And, you know, hopefully as people are training, I fear that sometimes in some fellowships, you might not get a lot of exposure to different things. It's difficult in the busiest fellowships you only do, you know, like several of these at that time. And so you, you learn a little bit as you go, but I think that our ability to do that is going to keep getting better too, because we're just building on all this knowledge that we already have. Great. Thank you. I uh, just wanted a question for both of you. You started with Dr. Miller, but 
Um, you know, the residents uh, in our institution oftentimes will ask us, you know, which one, which of these injuries needs to go in an external fixator? Do they all need to go in X fixes before they get fixed? Which I'm sure we all agree that's not true. But which ones do you say, hey, I want to put this in an external fixator? If you're taking them to the OR for a joint reduction, do they automatically get an external fixator? If they have a little sub subtle subluxation in one of the joints, do you take them and put them in their frame? Or, or what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Miller? So I think it's a good question. I definitely don't think they all need them. And as I kind of alluded to in my interview, um, it's actually pretty hard to dislocate a talus. So I think, um, you know, once you get it back in, if it's actually congruent, most of them are actually pretty stable. If they are not stable, that's when I would consider a next fix. So, you know, especially the talonavicular joint can be challenging. Sometimes that is not stable. Um, if you are having that incongruence that you were talking about, even if you've reduced it, but it still doesn't look like the subtalar joint is exactly right, those are the ones I would be more likely to X fix. Um, I do not necessarily X fix every single one if the residents did a reduction in the ED and it looks great and the post op CT shows that it's pretty well aligned. We just leave them in a splint until their soft tissues are ready to actually fix the fracture or otherwise ready, you know, if they're having other polytrauma issues. So for me, it is the really the ones that are unstable even after you reduce them, or if they're still having some little, like you were saying, subluxation or something that's not quite right. A lot of times those are, you know, some piece in the joint or something that's flipped in that's keeping them from reducing. And I think those are the ones we get an X fix and then get a CT to really figure out what more is going on. Thanks, Dr. Blair. Yeah, I think um, I, I agree with everything that Dr. Miller said. And, you know, just kind of building on that, um, I used external fixation relatively infrequently for these over the years because most, most of the time you can get a very reasonable reduction. It's not going to sublux on you in the splint. I think you have a pretty good idea about that in the OR. The tail and bigger joint is a little more, more futsy. And so if anything, maybe for that, but sometimes I might just put one K wire across to just to hang on to it. I don't like leaving a lot of wires in and I don't like that part contaminating the field. You know, we're gonna make incisions either, but it is important not to have anything displacing on you in your splint. Um, occasionally run into patients that have unusual soft tissue concerns. Maybe they've got burns or other things where you may want to have more open area. And then the external fixer will really hold it rigidly if you're not gonna use um, a real um, sturdy splint and or you just wanna have ready visualization tissues and, and keep, keep the ankle and the foot stable, then you know infrequently something like that might come up. Um, but I think for most of them, you probably don't need it. And you know, it's extra, it's extra expense. It's also extra contamination in your field. So I, 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 would, I think you know, it seems to me like maybe the last eight to 10 years, there's a lot more X fixes going on these injuries as well as other injuries, like even lower energy ankle fracture dislocations are getting X fixed more often and things happening staged. And so um, figure out if you really need it or not. If there's any question that you do, then by all means use that. But but it, it might not be one of those things that you necessarily need to jump to. And, and if you've only seen one or two and that's been the, what you saw, just kind of just ask yourself a question, you know, do we need to do this? And is that really helping? Um, I think it's not always as, as helpful for many of the, the tail and neck fractures, even if there was a fair amount of initial displacement. Thank you. Along the lines of that, if you are going to put them in an extra fixer, what type of frame construct are you going to use? Are you going to always put a midfoot pin in there? Or are you always going to put a pin in, the fourth, in four and five, or is it just injury dependent? Dr. Miller? Sorry, wasn't sure who was going first there. No, sorry. <laughs> no, not at all. I, um, you know, generally I would still do a delta frame for these, and I do like to have a midfoot pin. Um, in fellowship, we use midfoot pins for almost everything, pilon fractures included. And I've really gotten away from that in my practice. So I don't routinely put midfoot pins in for pilon fractures. We put them in kind of a posterior splint along with their frame, but we don't do a separate pin. 
Um, but this is definitely the one that I would use a pin for. And, you know, you can kind of decide, especially depending on their soft tissue and everything, but you can put it in the first or the fifth, fourth area. But I think um, for me, a midfoot pin is a really good idea for talus and more distal fractures. Thanks, Dr. Fleer. Yeah, I think that um, it really depends on the, the injury and the, and the tissues. You know, some of these combo injuries also have, you know, ankle fractures or profonds. And so you're going to tailor it based on what you're trying to accomplish with your fixer, of course, like anything. Um, but probably when I do it, the most common um, frame I would use would be kind of a medial based delta frame. You know, because usually you've got your fibula intact. You may or may not have a medial malfracture. Um, but uh, medial base tibial pin, calc pin, and then um, I like a trans cuneiform pin. I think it's easier to get the pin in there than it is in the navicular to do it accurately. It's also just a little further away from the, the talus and it's sturdier than using the, the metatarsals. So that's probably the most, most common way to do it, but very subject to variability depending on injury combinations. Great, thank you. Uh, Mike, did you have any additional questions? Well, I do, but I want to let uh, Adam Lee, who's joining us from sure. Phoenix as a co-moderator from Dignity Health to pose questions to our two uh, guest faculty. Greetings, thank you for joining in and for recording the videos and participating in general. Uh, it's kind of a segue to what Nick was getting at. So uh, so, so you have one that rolls in at, at dinner, dinner time, car accident, it's residents can't get it reduced. So you're, you're taking it to OR to get it reduced. Uh, uh, you try your, all of the closed things, you get them good and relaxed and it's not going closed and you're, you're doing open approaches. So I guess facet one is, uh, do you have a go-to where you open for said reduction? Uh, and then two, are you doing anything more definitive or is it uh, you know, open, reduce and pin, open, reduce and X-fix like we were kind of talking about, like what is your, what is your nine o'clock at night algorithm? I can take that one first. Um, that's a really interesting question. I mean, it's so, so personalized. First of all, as long as the patient is not is systemically unwell and actually can tolerate a, a surgical session, you know, then um, my tendency would be to try something percutaneous assisted, sometimes using like a transfixion pin in the calc, you'll have enough um, leverage on it to still get it reduced occasionally for a Hawkins uh, group three or four, but obviously, you know, those are gonna be more likely to require an open reduction. Um, and then if I feel like I understand the fracture well enough and it's just a neck, maybe with a little comminution, it's still relatively early, I may do the open reduction and just fix the whole thing. More often, um, that's not the case. It's getting later at night, things are going longer than I thought, I don't wanna cut a corner or you know, just compromise the quality of the um, work, let alone if there's any more advanced imaging I might wanna get before fixing it. Um, then I would do an open reduction, usually anteromedial, because I think that if you do just one incision, you can usually um, retrieve the uh, tailor body uh, back by doing that approach without doing the two incisions. Sometimes I've had to do both incisions just to retrieve it. I might add that um, many years back, I started routinely doing a little um, posterior uh, capsulotomy kind of longitudinally to help to bring the, the talus back in. And that, that helps a lot. I used to do it under floor. Now I kind of do it part by feel and part by direct visualization, but it's just something that I started doing and it doesn't seem to compromise the um, integrity of the um, soft tissue supports uh, or, or blood supply. The way it's done, that can help a lot in terms of, of expediting the open reduction of the dislocation when you, when you need to do that. Um, I would say then, we talked about the frame already, but sometimes a frame, sometimes not, maybe maybe a stout Kirshner wire or two, but often nothing and just, just want to back up. And I don't know, too, if you guys have run into this, I've, I've been a couple times in my practice, had a patient with a very severe head injury and then I'm in there working in the head injury, the ICP start worsening and they say, you know, can you stop, wrap it up? And I've, I've done the open reduction and I just stopped because of that a couple of times too. So it's, it's these weird things that, that crop up 
every once in a while. I don't know that there's a perfectly right or wrong answer. I think the thing is to have a good plan and to understand the different approaches and to have a series of tricks that you can go to um, to try things because they're, they're always more difficult than you think they'll be. And it's humbling sometimes how difficult the open reduction can be to get that body back. Those are all great points. I could not agree more about the fact that they can be a lot harder than you'd think, especially if somebody else has only tried in a closed reduction, then you think you'll just open it right up and it'll be easy to pop back in, but it can be a challenge. I think one other, just the only thing I would add, because those are all great points, is you have to think about your future incision. Um, if you're going to make an incision, because the foot is deformed when you know you're going in there with an unreduced talus so really try your best to plan for the incision that you're going to need not where you think it is currently based on the location of the talus i've had um i had one patient who had an open reduction in an outside hospital then sent to me for definitive fixation and the incision ended up almost dorsal on the foot and that is a real challenge because then it's hard for me to make the two standard medial and lateral incisions without having skin problems. So do try if you can, and it can be really hard, um, but try to see where you can um, make your incisions to make that helpful for the next time. For my answer, I would say if it's evening and I'm going there anyway to fix the thing or do an open reduction, I would probably just go ahead and fix it. Um, generally, I prefer to have a CAT scan after a reduction, of course, so we can make sure not only that we understand the fracture, but whether there are any subtalar fragments or anything else that we need to worry about. Um, but if we have to go for an open reduction, sometimes I will have them get a reduced or a unreduced CT while they're waiting for the OR, just so we can have an idea and then potentially fix it while we're in there and just try to make sure it's all cleaned out. I have a question for the two panelists um, or the two faculty, excuse me, is with, have you seen anyone that when these patients have the early reduction, open reduction, internal fixation, have you, did you see a higher rate of wound complications or wound uh, surgical site infections or uh, soft tissue failures in those patients versus the ones that are allowed to wait for soft tissue rest? And Dr. Miller, if you'd like to go first. I, um, I'm sure that that would be a great study to do that, you know, as far as I know, has not been done yet. My personal experience is that they don't seem to be significantly worse. I generally don't wait long on a talus. If they have another issue, like Dr. Valier was referring to, if they have a bad head injury or something else going on, of course, we may have to wait. But I don't worry nearly as much about feet as I do about a peel on or an ankle with bad wounds. So, or calcaneus, actually, I shouldn't say feet. Talus, I, I guess I would say the talus and the midfoot, I don't worry quite as much about making those incisions. And they're, they just seem to have a little bit more um, leeway, I guess, um, than a calcaneus or a pilon does, but I certainly would not operate on them if they had full thickness blisters or anything like that. Okay. Dr. Valier? I, I would have to agree, you know, um, both in looking at this, the, the old um, Harborview series, which um, the wound complications are, you know, are all, all, all commerce, all soft tissue complications were about 10%. And, you know, I think that Given the energy and part of that area and the high frequency of open fractures, people having other wounds too, it's not surprising that there's that level of soft tissue complications. Neither of those series that I've been involved with, both in current practice and then previously, has really had any ability to discern uh, that there were more um, infections or soft tissue issues for patients that were treated um, definitively on an earlier basis. But it just makes sense that there would be more risk if you looked at enough of them. So thankfully that hasn't been the case, but I think you know, meticulous soft tissue handling, judging your timing properly, I, I think it is faster doing these in terms of readiness for surgery than it is with most profans that I see as was, as was pointed out by Dr. Miller. Um, 
it just when in doubt you you can delay it's okay i mean we know that that's not going to influence the rate of oxygen occurs i think the most important thing is that you have a soft tissue envelope that you feel comfortable with and you have a, a surgical tactic implants available fresh time of the day um good radiography to do an effective job at at getting the anatomic alignment that's going to really um, affect your outcome and then one point too that you was mentioned a little bit earlier but i think probably is worth mentioning again I think that with the soft tissues, part of the problem may not manifest in the wound issue. It could because of undermining of the soft tissues, but probably more importantly, and the opportunity to damage any of the remaining blood supply. You have to be very careful about not dissecting up far dorsally or certainly not along the plantar surface of the remaining talus because there's, there's probably some vessels that are still there on a lot of these and I think that uh, if you're not careful with your dissection uh, and even retractor placement, you could probably do some more iatrogenic damage. It's just me speculating because I think it's so easy to do that. Okay, thank you. Um, it will this this question will lead to a clinical follow up, um, but I wanted to know what how do you view the minimally displaced. Uh, Hawkins type one that don't have any radiographic or imaging evidence on your in your system of dislocation or subluxation, are those ones you know? Do you use the argument of your to prevent displacement? You may fix percutaneously or still through an open approach to prevent displacement, or do you follow them clinically and at what interval with serial radiographs, um, or does it more to global? Do you, you know take into account this is a polytrauma and they have ipsilateral lower extremity injuries. And I just wanted to get your sense of how you view, not as exciting of injuries, but how do you view these minimally displaced not without dislocation events recorded? Uh, Dr. Miller, if you'd like to go first. Um, I guess I'm definitely more in the aggressive camp on those. I would definitely fix them. I do generally tend to do a percutaneous fixation if the, if it really is truly non-displaced. And by that, I mean, you can only see it on CT or MRI, not even, you know, a line on the x-ray really. But I think in those cases, especially for a polytrauma, I would fix them, you know, hopefully to help them mobilize more quickly. But in general, I just think the risk of displacing is so high or the consequences, I guess I should say, of displacement is potentially so high and it's such a minimal procedure to fix them percutaneously. It's kind of like a femoral neck fracture that's non-displaced. I would much rather put some screws in it and keep it from moving. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Um, and these are really infrequent cases because most of the time you're imaging something else and then you pick it up because you didn't see it on the plane radiography. Maybe you're looking at an adjacent fracture. And I think the cases I can think of with that always had some other injury that I was treating relatively nearby. Maybe it was a, a profond or something else. And so I'll, I'll generally place some screws in the talus too. Um, certainly if there's any malalignment, you wanna correct that and be very cautious about um, looking at it because it's easy to just stabilize it in situ when it, there is some angular malalignment um, or whatnot. Uh, but to me, it's better to know that it's more secure, especially if you want to start some motion. And then that's a good reason to, you know, sometimes on really comminuted fractures and or uh, unreliable patient clientele, I will mobilize them more after just to protect things. Yet it's nice to know, hey, you know, there's a couple of screws in there holding this neck. It wasn't displaced, but I don't really need to worry about it because now it's, it's fixed. Don't need to immobilize it because they do get extremely stiff really quickly. And so uh, being able to do that, I think is really um, worthwhile. I might mention too that, you know, when you think about a Hawkins group one versus a two, you know, two being subluxation or dislocation, so two A subluxation, what is that? I think there's a little bit of an area there where it's, it's debatable. Um, maybe there's a couple millimeters of displacement and some people would say, well, that's group one. To me, group one is really there's just a non-displaced fracture. It's fairly discernible on plain x-rays. And some people, when I train, would say, well, that doesn't even exist. If you can see it on the plain x-ray, it's already subluxed. Purest in that sense. I'm not completing that camp, but I get it. And so for me, a two-way would be just a few millimeters of 
displacement, but no associated dislocation event. And that's going to be in my hands in an open reduction. You can always fix it. More reliable alignment, more uh, reliable maintenance of alignment, and um, better healing. And, you know, if there's no combination, of course, you can press the fracture and you can unite quicker, less chance of not uniting. Uh, thank you both for your answers. Uh, with respect to clinical follow-up, outside of a patient that's included in a study, um, how long do you follow these clinically? You know, six months, a year, have you been able to get anyone to come back at two years? Like what, what ideally for you would be the longest time interval you could reasonably expect in the patient with this injury? Or that you would request that they come back for? I try for two years, um, but it's tough if you're not really hounding them. A lot of our patients will disappear. And, and the ones that are having trouble, those are the ones that tend to come back. Either they're having trouble or they're looking for some sort of out to qualify for disability or something. And, and so they'll, they'll come back. But the people that are doing well or, or functional enough oftentimes don't come back. And so I try to follow them for two years and I try to let them know hey, this is an important injury as I do with other like tibia pulpon, calx, um, other articular injuries, particularly in the in the, in the foot and ankle area, um, to try to keep them plugged in. And, and the follow up uh, in my hands is 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 not that good. But you get some that will come back. I think if you lay the groundwork and try to follow them. So as you go, you know, first post op visit at say two two and a half weeks out, and see them again around six weeks, twelve weeks, and then maybe either three months or six months depending on their injury. One year, two year is my usual. I, uh, for a long time, told all my patients with a high risk of avian, including the displaced talus, the hip dislocation, you know, acetabular fracture dislocations, and the femoral neck fractures, that I wanted to follow them for two years. And I would explain to them, you know, their avian rates and everything like that. But I do agree with Dr. Blair that it is extremely challenging to get them to actually come back. And most of my two-year follow-ups are ones that are having a problem at two years and want to talk about it. So, um, you know, they don't really come back that often, but I do think that would be ideal. So I try to at least get them to all come back at a year and I tell them, please try to come back a year from now. Um, but probably if I actually looked at my numbers, they're not very high of people who actually come back at that point. Thank you. And I'll, I'll turn it back in the final uh, and most five minutes here to Adam, uh, followed by Nick, if there's any additional questions that they have for our two guests. Well, time, you just mentioned it, Dr. Miller. And how, how are you counseling patients? Like, what do you, what do you tell them on the front end expectations and to try to get them to assure that they're, they're going to come back for that two-year follow-up to get them kind of engaged on the front end? I think the biggest thing for me is to really get the patient to understand Dr. Valier's work that really the initial injury is the major problem and we can do everything we can, put it back as quickly as we can, as perfectly as we can, but what's done is done. And I try to tell him that not in a, you know, people talk about laying the creep and things like that, but I'm really trying to do it more in an educational way so they have a really honest understanding of what their problem is and that we do have potential solutions down the road if they get really bad ankle arthritis or subtalar arthritis and they need a fusion or they have you know pain that's inhibiting them but I want them to be realistic about you know you may not get back to marathon running and things like that and um, have a real good conversation about that. And also that they know that when they see their x-ray at three months or six months, that doesn't mean that they've won the game yet and that we really need that longer follow-up. And that's kind of the way I get them to hopefully buy in is tell them from the beginning that by two years, we'll really know once and for all. And hopefully that'll get them to come back. Do you have anything else, Adam? I don't think I have anything else, question-wise. No, uh, just to extend the question to uh, Dr. Valier, if- Oh, sorry about that. Well, ju just the, just the, you know, is there anything different? How are you, how are you cancel counseling your patients? Say, you know, the dust is settled, they're at their first post-op visit, the wounds look good, so we're, we're probably out of the acute complication phase. You know, how do you engage them and set their expectations for, 
okay, now how does this part of the recovery go? What's it look like between two weeks and two years? I, I try to kind of model a little bit on what you know, Dr. Miller just touched on. I think at the outset, I talked with them about these are injuries that have had um, a lot of challenges um, because of the energy in part of the soft tissue. So there's risks for wound problems and, and infections. Then the blood supply, and that can lead to, and I explained with the lumen shirts a little bit well, what osteonecrosis is, and that will manifest some number of months, generally later in about half the time it can revascularize, but it's something you want to keep an eye on to make sure they're not um, having collapse. Um, and that many people develop post-traumatic arthritis. And if, if they've got a body element, of course, talk a little more about the ankylosis and tailor joint, just kind of explain personally, that's why we're gonna to wanna to keep track of what's going on with you. So try to give them a little synopsis of how things can go. Yet I really struggle with this still, uh, want them to know that this is serious, yet many people are gonna be able to return to a lot of their activities. Now, if they're doing a lot of high-end athletic activities and it's, it's simply not realistic, I'll try to counsel them that that may not be in the, in the cards for the future. But for a lot of my patients that um, enjoy some recreational exercise, non-impact uh, activities or minimally impactful activities, I try to talk with them about ways to maybe modify down the road depending on how their recovery is going and whether or not they have some complications their foot will be different. And because of that, I tried to enlist them to, to work with me. I'm guessing that probably only about a third of people actually follow through. I haven't looked for a while, <laughs> but it's funny. You know, those are the ones at night you think about and you go, hey, there's that guy. Yeah, he never came back after six months. Hope he's okay. Um, but in, in, I used to spend so much more time kind of trying to hunt people down and calling them on the phone and tracking and stuff. My life has gotten much busier since then, and I've also started to get a little more comfortable, I think, with um, my own strengths and weaknesses and, and practice and recognize that I can't, I can't follow these people around. Some are gonna come back, some of them aren't, and, and I wish that we could get more information because I learn, I continue to learn from them, and, and that's important, um, as well as just to make sure that they're educated properly so that if there is something that we could offer a treatment intervention for that, that they're aware to, to maximize their own function. Well, uh, thank you so much for all your time uh, with the recorded interviews and these this very thoughtful uh, question and answer session, which I greatly enjoyed being part of. Um, so this will conclude our time. I'm just going to quick go through our final slides. Um, but again, thank you as it approaches 9, 10, 9, 15 on the East Coast. So thank you, Dr. Valier, uh, Valier and Dr. Miller very much. Thank you. So just final take home messages to always respect the soft tissues and the vascular, the talus, especially with respect to your surgical planning, as well as your intraoperative dissection. Understand the injury characteristics that uh, may affect the sequelae of these injuries and also recognize the severity of these injuries so you can counsel patients that we've, as we've just discussed extensively about their outcomes with respect to their foot and ankle and expectations uh, for the rest of their life with respect to their uh, foot and ankle. As a final reminder, the upcoming, upcoming journal club sessions will be Tuesdays, October 26th, which is the week after OTA, uh, discussing femoral shaft fractures, and then November 16th, focusing on Liz Frank foot injuries. Thank you again. Uh, and lastly, this recording will be uh, shared on the YouTube AO North America website for further review. Uh, thank you so much, and I hope you enjoy. Mm -hmm.